have Barry Starr from Wall Street Horizon, Jeff Craig from Ursus Space, Edward Oliver from Data Miner, and myself uh, from Amass Insights. So I think yesterday, you know, we did a really good job at looking at alternative data uh, as a whole, uh, how it's evolved, um, and it was very holistic. You know, I think today and the, the, the intention with this uh, panel is to take a deeper dive into specific data categories uh, across social sentiment, uh, behavior, across financial events, uh, and obviously, um, you know, satellite uh, technology. So I think it's a good starting point if you guys just want to do uh, brief introductions uh, about yourself and what your companies do. Uh, yeah, I'll start. Uh, my name is Ed Oliver. I work at Data Miner. Um, Data Miner is a real-time event detection company. And uh, very, you know, kind of the elevator pitch to give you is uh, we look at publicly available information. Uh, primarily, it's been around social media, uh, but we're beginning to look at other publicly available data, looking for events, breaking news, breaking events as they occur, giving our clients across finance, corporate security, public sector, PR comms and news, detection and events and alerts around events as they occur. Um, people witness things all day long, smartphones in their hand, as they see and hear things, they're broadcasting it via social media and other publicly available uh, platforms. We find that information and feed it to our clients in real time. Um, and so the application from, from a financial standpoint is simply knowing uh, more information sooner, having a better informed uh, process and being able to make uh, a much better decision whether you're investing in real time or, or looking at a longer term point of view. Um, my prior background, prior to being a data miner, uh, was as a trader. I traded equities at Citigroup for a number of years, and uh, so I've been able to bring a lot of that experience in the markets uh, to what we do at data miner. Uh, hi, I'm Barry Starr. I run Wall Street Horizon. I was up here yesterday. To my knowledge, uh, the company is still the same, and I'm still running it. Uh, the uh, Wall Street Horizon, uh, for 15 years, we've been uh, we're the gold standard for tracking corporate events. So the next earnings date, conference calls, dividend splits, M&As, class action lawsuits, all those types of things for uh, investors, traders, uh, folks on the buy side. Hi, I'm Jeff Craig. I'm a energy analyst at Ursa Space Systems. We're a startup uh, based in Ithaca, New York, and uh, we work in the commodity space using uh, satellite imagery to monitor uh, global supply chain uh, for commodities. And so we, we work with uh, satellites that are equipped with synthetic aperture radar. This is a very powerful technology that can cut through clouds. It can look in at, uh, at nighttime, anywhere uh, in the world at any time. Um, and we're turning that, those images into uh, data that provides insight into market fundamentals. We're primarily in oil right now, looking at inventories, global inventories. So this is the kind of data that talks about, that really reveals uh, the fundamentals and uh, gets ahead of the um, existing information, which comes primarily from government sources that can be weeks, months uh, delayed. And last, and very much least, uh, Amass Insights, uh, we're building a market network that connects data providers like themselves uh, to third-party tools uh, in the asset management space. So, guys, I want to get into kind of the category movements and evolution. Um, do you want to just kind of start by describing the inception of your category? Um, and how mature you feel uh, your respective category of alternative data is? Yeah, um, I'll start. So, you know, obviously everybody knows social media. We've been using social media for a number of years personally. Um, obviously, it's been a really big story over the last couple of years from uh, the political standpoint. Uh, I, we uh, were started back in 2009, and our, our CEO, our founder, saw nearly nine, ten years ago the value of social media as a way to find out what's going on in the world, as the broadcast network. Uh, if you think about you know, breaking news on TV, CNN, etc., um, they're reporting those events after the effects, and, and social media is really the way to find out when those events are happening on the ground at the moment. And there's a real value to knowing that, uh, again, across any sort of industry that needs real-time information, that needs to make critical decisions in real time. And so, you know, nine years ago, it was an idea. Uh, now it's a company. Um, we're, uh, we've been in business nine years. We've uh, built a number of different verticals. 
and I think the, the maturity of the market is certainly there, but I think there's also a, a level of evolution that occurs on a regular basis as new platforms come, come online, as, uh, as current events change. I mean, two years ago, we weren't really looking uh, at the political sphere, the geopolitical sphere from a financial standpoint. Now that's a huge uh, part of what we do. We we're looking mostly at the equity side of things. And so as, uh, as the, the world changes, as current events change, and as the needs for information change, we've been trying to evolve with it. So I think it's a mature business, it's a mature market looking at social media and other public data, uh, but I think it's gonna continue to evolve as the world changes. Uh, and at this point, the world changes so quickly that uh, we just have to keep up with that, that rate of change. For a, uh, an asset manager, Wall Street Horizon actually meshes really nice to with what you guys do because you're tracking events as they happen now. What Wall Street Horizon does is it gives an investment professional a view over the horizon of things that are gonna happen in the future. So what we do is we track uh, corporate events, 40 different corporate events, like I said before. Earnings, dividends, splits, uh, the next uh, same store sales uh, announcement, even uh, movie release dates, things like that. And you know, the business can be broken in, in, into two pieces. One is the calendar itself, and the second, which is much more alt data related, which are the revisions, the changes to that, to those dates. And it turns out there's a lot of academic research, excuse me, that shows that you can determine a, you can help to determine a, co a company's financial health by looking at how those dates move around on the calendar. And, uh, you know, all that, uh, combined, uh, you know, our clients use this information to basically not miss things. They use it to either on the on the top side, they can trade into it, or from a risk management uh, perspective, they can trade around it. And so what we do is we help our clients to prevent from missing out on important catalytic events that can move markets. I think for, in terms of satellite imagery and its use in the commodity space, I think it's pretty immature right now. Um, oil, uh, oil trading, for example, um, relies very heavily upon the news, so the real-time events that people can kind of quickly digest that could be market-moving. These are the headlines that break, and you'll see, especially the geopolitical events, but also economic data. The market is very comfortable with the regularly scheduled data releases from uh, government bodies, your regular economic calendar. What, they're not, what it's not used to is, is looking at places in the world, like China, for example, where there's, we're trying to peel back a layer of uh, kind of secrecy around that data and provide near real-time data. There's kind of more of a, um, a kind of herd mentality to trust maybe what comes from the Chinese government, even though there's probably a lot of skepticism, it's what people generally feel comfortable with. So we're trying to push the envelope and say, you know what, there's an, al there's an alternative to this, and we can see things from space that we don't need the Chinese government to tell us what's going on, and, but I still, it's still the early stages, and there's a lot of education involved in winning people's trust in the technology itself. Yeah, I think it's interesting if you think about what we do and the connections that we have. You know, Barry's company looks at, at company-related information, looking at the changes in what's already scheduled. Um, Ursa looks at satellite information around the energy market. We're looking at real-time events and how those potentially impact the kind of the near-term, mid-term, and long-term views of what people are looking at for their respective companies. From an all-dative standpoint, you know, the importance of alternative data as a source of information, regardless of what you're looking at, is really important. And I think it's important to kind of think of what your, your goals are. All data itself as a business is mature, but I think there's always new data sets, there's always new use cases. And so I think it's kind of a combination of it's mature, but it's not at the same time. Because you just don't know what's going to change. You don't know how satellite imagery can be used differently today than it was being used four or five years ago and how it might be used five years from now. That's a good point. So obviously, I mean, you, you know, you guys have your data collection piece and your businesses have evolved over time. You know, maybe you started from delivering very raw granular data and then uh, created derivative products over time uh, to reach a wider audience of uh, potential investors. Um, can you just kind of go through some of the challenges of, you know, going through that product development process and um, uh, catering to a wider audience? 
Yeah, like for, for us, our challenge initially from a finance perspective years ago, four or five years ago, was focusing primarily around the equity markets, focusing primarily around uh, alpha generation, and realizing as we went through that social media is a random, unstructured data set, so we can't predict when the events are going to occur, we just have to make sure we capture them. So we also began thinking about, okay, well, where else do these events occur and how else can we broadcast these events? So we went from being very purely equity focused years ago to looking at geopolitical, looking at energy. You know, when a refinery blows up on the ground and someone takes pictures and video of that, that's really important news for the markets. Uh, and so it's really the evolution again of thinking about where is there a need uh, in the market and do we have a, a tool that can provide the, the, you know, that need. So we went you know, really from being very purely equity and, and all data or it's just alpha driven, excuse me, to situational awareness, to knowledge around what's going on, to just having better information that you may trade off of or you may just simply say my portfolio needs to be adjusted based on this and we'll take a longer term view as a result. So, uh this story is as much an entrepreneurial story as anything else. 15 years ago when we started this, we delivered the data um, uh, in an email and online as an online calendar. And our clients, as we got really accurate, we started moving into uh, working with uh, you know, market makers and moving uh, and, and quants. They said, um, we don't want it uh, on, on the screen, we want to see it machine readable. So we created a whole bunch of machine readable uh, files and over time, most of our business became machine readable. At uh, maybe five, six years ago, we had 30 different files that we delivered. We and we had clients who said, "Hey, can't you give it to me all in one place instead of having 30 different files?" We, you know, if you wanted to look up, um, you know, Roku Labs, you'd have to look at 30 different files to get all the information on Roku Labs. So we came up with a product called Enchilada, I'm sorry, but like the whole Enchilada, where you get it all in one place on a screen. And so we did that, and people said, that's great, that's exactly what we're looking for, but then a whole new group of people came in and said, yeah, that's great, but can you give it to me in a machine-readable way? So we went back to machine-readable. So now we've thrown up our hands, and we now deliver it on a screen, we deliver it machine readable, we deliver it API, we deliver it on a streaming socket, we basically deliver it however any people, people want it because every day someone comes to us with a new use case and you know, it's, it's, the data is half of it, but it's getting the data to the client in the way that they want it so they can use it in a way that's profitable to them is um, ultimately what it's all about. Yeah, the, the same would apply for, for us as well, developing the, the user case around uh, the, the data. We started with uh, China, that was our initial product, was looking at oil inventories in China, and that made a lot of sense because it was, as I said before, it was a place that was lacking transparency. Now we've gone global, um, 150 locations around the world looking at the amount of oil in inventory. Um, but the ultimate goal is to track commodity from, at least for oil, for the case for oil, uh, we could say from the wellhead you know, to the water for an export to ultimately to a, a refinery, so from the beginning to the end. And when you have that complete picture, I think that's a very powerful, um, very, so it's very powerful and then to be able to replicate that into other commodities that would be the, the ultimate goal. But see, so it's a, it's a long, it's a long journey. Mm -hmm. And if we could fast forward to the end, we'd have a, a beautiful picture. We could look at a port in China, the port of Dalian, for example, where there's a hub of activity. You're seeing oil, you're seeing grain, metals, mm -hmm. uh, tanker flows. This is, a, um, you know, you, this is a lens into the Chinese economy that you probably can't get otherwise. But, that's a long, <laughs> we're not there yet. Yeah. So it's a matter of uh, starting with this kernel, this idea, and, but keeping the user cases going mm -hmm. to get to that end point. So that, as I said, we're, we're earlier in the process, I think. So it's um, interesting to hear from you guys who are you're farther along. Yeah, and that's, you know, I was gonna ask you that because I had the privilege at the Cordell Club to see your guys' presentation mm -hmm. the other week. And you guys have some very interesting, it's a SAR technology. SAR, yes. Which allows you to uh, essentially read through all weather conditions. Right. Um, how can that type of technology really be applied to other commodities? Or what else can it measure? 
Well, Cause, but it, first thing that comes yeah. to mind is like, you know, something like potentially crop yields or... Sure. There's some, yeah, there's some good examples like that have been, been used. It has a wide application. Yeah. And just again, if you're trying to visualize this, it, synthetic aperture radar is not the same as an optical photo like you would see on a Google Earth mm -hmm. image where the only time you're going to see something is on a nice clear day for a reason because it can't look, it can't penetrate the clouds. Synthetic aperture radar was a technology developed during the Cold War for military yeah. purposes and only recently has been commercialized. So this has only been the past few years. The, the image itself has, it's very rich. It's not like, an optical photo is just sort of a flat 2D image. The SAR, you can measure, not, you're not just um, looking at an image, it captures heat, it captures velocity, material characteristics, all of which can be used for a wide range of, of applications. It's impressive. Um, so this is actually catered more, uh, this next question to you guys. So, you know, you're capturing, um, you know, obviously all this event data, right? Is it just, at the end of the day, is it just all about speed and getting it as quick as possible to your clients? No. We have, um, we have some clients that pick it up once a day. We have some clients that pick it up every three hours. We have some clients that pick it up every five minutes. And we have clients that pick it up, uh, actually, we push it to them on a, uh, on a, on a streaming basis. Uh, Josh Livnet at New York University, Eric So at MIT, wrote a couple of papers on earnings releases a couple of years ago using our data, and they showed that you can make money trading earnings dates um, because of earnings drift, because of information drift. That um, yes, uh, you know, maybe I forget what the numbers are. Maybe 30 percent, forty percent of the change does move relatively fast. But in fact, there is alpha to be found, you know, minutes, hours, days, and even weeks after the event. And so, um, yeah, you're giving up a little bit in the uh, sub-second market, if you will, but uh, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity that is not real-time based. Yeah, I would agree. I think, you know, is speed important? Yes. Um, but I think it's also around the context uh, of, of the information. I think it's also around how that event evolves. Um, you know, there could be a point in time that something occurs, you know, refinery blows up, but now it's, where is that refinery? Who owns that refinery? How big is that refinery? How bad is the damage? Or, you know, so all of that is information that's not just that moment, and, and that's not gonna come quickly, that's gonna come over time. Um, and what we found is, again, social media is a great way to get direct information from sources on the ground, um, but it may take a few minutes. It may take an hour to really get the full concept of, uh, of that story. But then after the fact, you're going to find out what it really means to the market. And it may be minutes, it might be hours, it might be days. Um, we've seen cases where uh, something happened in, a, in a, an obscure place that uh, you know, no one's really aware of. And it took hours for the market to even know that it occurred and then digest it and then react to it. Um, but then we've seen cases where something happens and immediately there's a move. So it's... Yeah. It's speed is, is part of the conversation, but I think it's the context, it's the, it's the source of the information, and it's a bit more than just that one uh, factor. I'm really excited to uh, get into specific use cases of you know, how your data is being applied. Uh, but before we get to that next section, uh, does anyone have any questions? Okie doke. So yeah, so going back to that. So um, if you guys don't mind, uh, Go through an example of a successful implementation of your firm's alternative data, uh, if you can. Yeah, I think the easiest one um, for us for, for, to talk about is uh, around kinetic events, things that are happening to physical uh, locations on the ground. And we've had a number of oil-related, energy-related examples, refineries, pipelines, where they were significant enough that there was a, a, a move in the market. Uh, in the gas market, the you know the the, uh, the crude markets, um, what we've gotten feedback-wise from uh, users in the, that that space is that, you know, we appreciate getting these early heads up, these early detections of events that are happening on the ground to facilities that we know are important, 
Um, one, we get it immediately, and we may not know all the perfect information, we may not know every single detail, but now we know something's happening. We be can begin to monitor it via our products uh, or via other means, uh, and then waiting for more official uh, statements and announcements. But again, that early detection, that early alerting, gives them better information to then create a bit of a decision tree as they're thinking, okay, where do I go? If the market does this, if this is this, where do we go? Um, so from a, you know, kind of a general use case, the ability to, to track these events on the ground and not just get an alert when something happens, but also get this continued update um, over the, the course of the event, whether it's you know, within the minutes and hours that it's occurring or over the course of days, um, that ability to track those, uh, those types of events is, is really valuable uh, to clients and it, become, it can become an alpha generation uh, opportunity or it can become a situational awareness risk mitigation situation where they can just simply know better information and know more information and, and make better decisions. Uh, one of my favorite uh, examples, we have a client uh, who is uh, in a uh, portfolio manager, very large position, tracks 122 utility stocks. And he asked, I don't have an iPad here, so I'm, iPad, so I'm just going to use this as a proxy for an iPad. And he said, he said, it's really simply, he said, every morning when I get up, that before I go to the gym, I want on my iPad for all the 122 names that I track, I want to know everything that's going to happen today everything that's gonna to happen tomorrow, and everything that happened, everything that changed yesterday, okay? So I wanna know that there's a dividend coming, uh, the, there's a payday coming tomorrow for one of my stocks, I wanna know that there's an earnings date, I wanna know that um, there's an SEC due date filing, uh, there's a quarter end, or changed, I wanna know that uh, there was a shareholder meeting. They were going to hold the shareholder meeting out on the West Coast, but they moved it to the East Coast. By the way, that's a very negative signal. Um, they wanted uh, that uh, there's maybe uh, for one of his 122 names that um, someone's speaking at a conference and it was going to be a senior product manager and it got elevated to the CEO of the company. That's a positive signal. Or the CEO was supposed to speak and they've been swapped out by the senior product manager. That's a negative signal. And so. Uh, there's a real simple, it's not, that's not a speed use case at yeah. all, where every morning, give me a list of all the things I have to worry about for the stocks I, can, I worry about today. Be, uh, before joining URSA, I actually covered the oil market as a reporter, and as I mentioned before, the, the real-time news events um, and the economic calendar were two of the big forces driving the market on a daily basis. You would see those the market always respond to these kinds of events. One question, though, that in the market that's really not answered is a very simple one. It couldn't be a more basic question about supply and demand and what's the balance. Every day in the oil market, there's either an oversupply or undersupply. It's never really perfectly in balance. Yet, if you ask anyone in the market on a given day, what is that balance, at best, it's a guess, maybe an educated guess, and um, it could be a consensus <laughs> among people, but it's not, people are, are at best reading the tea leaves because the market is so aggregated, disaggregated that it's a very, very difficult question to answer. In concrete terms, what this means is that if the market is, say, oversupplied by a million barrels a day, at the end of the week, there are seven million barrels to account for that have ended up in storage. These are very large tanks, oil tanks, located around the world. And so what we're doing is looking at these tanks on a weekly basis. And what we do is we measure, we, so the tanks have a floating lid, okay? It's not a, a roof. The lid, goes up and down depending on how full it is. And what we do is we take an image of 10,000 tanks every week and we measure the amount in storage based upon the height of the lid. And this gives us a, a number, a, a global inventory um, uh, number. And that is something that has been missing from the market and provides uh, a very good starting point for knowing the most basic question imaginable, um, which is the supply and demand uh, balance. So I guess this is more catered to Edward and uh, Jeff. So what 
What other industries just outside of investing um, is your data useful for? Yeah, we're in uh, other verticals besides finance. We have a corporate security vertical um, that we sell to global security operations centers. You have a large multinational company. It's got people and facilities all over the world. They want to know what's happening uh, in those places and around those people so they can control that. Uh, we have a public sector business that sells to state local governments as well as the federal government. Uh, we have a news vertical um, that's selling to news organizations, to reporters, so that they can know when things are happening and then take the next step to go out and, and do further investigation. Uh, and then we launched about a year or so ago a PR corporate comms vertical, um, looking a bit more around you know things that are happening for companies. It, it, it's a little bit of sentiment, although I want, we don't do sentiment, but it's a little bit of a way for, for a PR firm or a company of crisis comm departments to really understand what's happening. Uh, a great example would be you know uh, your Chipotle, and someone gets sick in one of your restaurants, and they're tweeting about it, or, or they're Instagramming about it, or using sharing on social media, and that becomes a bit of a conversation. You'd like to know that sooner rather than later, so you can begin to so manage. So you actually it. capture information outside of Twitter, so other social media channels. We have, yeah, we've begun. We've historically been a partner with Twitter. That was yeah. our, our primary data source. Uh, we over the last year or so begun to incorporate other social media and other public data in the product as well. So not just Twitter. Um, but other uh, social media platforms and um, other public data. So we're thinking about you know blogs, obscure blogs, and how they might break information, uh, sensors, you know, uh, a geographic, geological sensor, uh, you know, triggers an earthquake reading, and what does that mean from a kind of a knock-on effect from there? To be in, again, to in real time, something's going on. Let's figure out what it is. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it's not about here's an alert, something's happening, good luck. It's here's an alert, something's happening. Here's another piece of information that says what it is. Here's another piece of information that shows you what the damage is, and so on. So there's an evolution of timeline uh, that that we try to provide to our clients across those verticals to let them know what's what's going on. Interesting. Half of our business is still um, is uh, government related. Half of it's commercial. I was discussing the commercial aspect, but half of it is still um, U.S. Uh, government and other friendly government um, governments are clients in performing more kind of traditional um, national security type role for those clients. Um, we also have a custom monitoring service, so people come to us with kind of more one-off requests. Um, there could be, you know, an event in, in, in Libya or Nigeria, and so it's kind of a, a specific uh, incident. We also do work um, that's uh, not commercial. It's, it's meant to, for the benefit of, of, of the greater society, uh, things around um, natural disasters, like uh, if there's a hurricane, we'll do work on uh, flood mapping of a region that's affected. Okay. So um, I want to get into kind of the additional tools or third-party partnerships that you guys have, um, you know, brought to make your data more compelling. Um, you know, I know with Edward, you guys uh, recently partnered with the EMS platform called FlexTrade, and um, I believe Ursa, you guys partnered with, um, is it Clipper Data? Yeah, so do you guys mind just kind of going through some of the third-party tools and you know, maybe partnerships that you guys have established uh, recently um, that makes your product more compelling? Yeah, we uh, established a, a partnership with uh, FlexTrade about a year or so ago to uh, provide our content in one of their EMS systems. And so, you know, Barry referred to it earlier, you know, we want to make sure the data can get to our clients however they want to receive it. You know, it's all about integrating into their workflow. So we have a dashboard that you can log into and it can be on your screen. You know, being a former trader, there's no way I remember where every single thing is on my screen. So I want other ways to get information. I already have something. How can I get your data fed into it? Uh, and so the uh, partnership with FlexTrade was a way to say, well, FlexTrade is established. People are using their EMS system. What better way to provide additional value uh, to that product than to give them real-time information fed in so they can have a portfolio that they're managing um, using it to execute orders, and they can also see news about those companies or they have uh, you know, foreign exchange that they might be uh, trading. They can get macro and geopolitical information uh, to, to be able to just understand what's going on and uh, to, to make adjustments as they're, they're trading. Uh, and so that's been, been a partnership uh, we've done. We've also uh, created a partnership with uh, ICE uh, a little over a year and a half or so ago. Um, 
if you remember a few years ago, Yahoo Messenger was used widely in the oil markets uh, as a way to share information amongst oil traders. Uh, when that was no longer useful because of a number of changes, many people moved to ICE, uh, to the ICE chat platform. We created a mechanism in ICE that will feed uh, oil market information to ICE traders, uh, traders using ICE um, for, uh, for messaging. Um, so again, finding ways to integrate into the existing workflows to make sure this information gets into the right hands uh, at the right time. Um, so we have a partnership with a company called Clipper Data. They uh, track tanker flows around the world. So the two, our data and their, and, and, and their data work together because we're measuring inventories at major ports around the world. A major determinant of the levels in storage will be obviously when a tanker arrives or departs. So looking just at inventories um, without the without understanding the, the kind of coming and going of, of tanker tankers um, maybe you know you, you kind of need both I guess uh, is what I'm saying we've also created a product in in for China where we we uh, calculate refinery demand in China combining our data with the storage plus the clipper data on the imports and exports from Chinese ports to back into a refinery demand number. Another partner of ours is S&P Global, and we work with them <coughs> on a product we're developing to measure production in the Permian Basin in West Texas. So they are tracking a lot of the permitting and uh, the, the records that are filed uh, with, with the, the uh, regulators and we're, we're developing a product around that where, where we're measuring the flaring activity and we use the, the permitting to kind of guide us in terms of where to look um, to, for the flaring. So I'm getting the, uh, the time warning here and I want to reserve some uh, questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Sorry, it's really hard to... Yeah, so um, it's more for Edward and Barry. Um, about having different sources to kind of verify an event or uh, information. Um, you know, for example, the geological uh, um, thing that you mentioned. Uh, do you have like a confidence score on that event as well? Like, is there mm -hmm. like, okay, this is 100% an event, or um, mm -hmm. do you also do you also kind of track events that aren't you're not so sure about yet? Or if it's weighted. Yeah. So we, we don't have anything specific like that in our product, but what we do, it, it kind of the way we find the information. Um, especially around social media, it's more about uh, clustering or groups of, of posts at, a sa at the same time. So using a very simple example with Twitter, we would never alert on a single tweet about something because it could be bogus, it could be fake news, to use a term that we've thrown around for We've got years. plenty of that. Exactly. Um, but what, we're, what we've done, we've, you know, we've been able to study social media and Twitter for a long time to understand how events, real events, occur, how an anomaly of tweets or social media posts occur around an event. Uh, and we use that as a way to, to, to verify that event. Uh, and and there will, you know, Twitter, you know, kind of thinking from a trader standpoint, social media, Twitter particularly, but social media generally is, is very self-correcting, like the market is efficient and in information going through it. Um, so I've always found that if something is incorrect in Twitter, it will not take very long for it to be corrected by the Twitter sphere, so to speak. Uh, and so we rely on that to an extent too, but we've done a lot of work around understanding you know, what fake handles look like, what fake news looks like in Twitter to be able to focus on when things are happening. And honestly, a lot of the real time kinetic events are, are image and video rich. And so it's very easy to verify based on imagery. 100% uh, of our data is publicly available data. We do not work with the non-material, non-public information. 99% of our data is collected from the primary source, either from the company directly or a US, US government entity. Uh, the 1%, I'm happy to sit over a beer and we can talk about the 1%. There are a couple of tiny little situations uh, that go with it. But all the events we track, we know they're going to happen. In fact, the business we're in is forecasting and telling people when to prepare to be ready that a dividend is going to get paid or someone is going to speak at an event. And so it's just a question of, of when it is. And, and uh, we put a lot of our time and effort into really um, the accurate forecasting of when those things are going to happen. So for Ed, the, 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 um, you would never send out a, you would attempt to have a 0% false positive. 
That's yes, that's the attempt. And, and Barry made a great point too. We, we also are only accessing publicly available information. So our partnership with Twitter gives us access to all publicly available Twitter. We don't have access to any private information, private handles, anything like that. We're only accessing publicly available data. Um, that you know, but it, the, again, the the big idea is there's a lot of that information out there. It's hard to aggregate it into a useful format, uh, and so we're trying to put structure to what what's what's a pretty huge unstructured amount of information. Great. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.